All right. Well, there's, there's a little bit of flavor for what's coming here this morning. Uh, I, uh, I love to preach about Jesus. I've been, uh, been praying a lot about the series that we're going to do next. We have this message uh, next Sunday, the 4th of July. Uh, it's going to be a great service. We have the Craig family uh, missionaries will be here with us. Uh, Pastor Farouk is going to preach a message for us on the 4th of July. I'm super excited uh, to, about that. I think he told me he's preaching on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which that's going to be, that's going to be good. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but then after that, I have two more messages. So we're almost done. So I've been praying a lot about what the Lord um, has next. Um, so probably next Sunday, I will tell you about that. I think the Lord's um, I've already started work on the next sermon series, so we're excited about that. But today, we continue the series in the Revelation. Today, the title of the message is Armageddon and the Second Coming. So Armageddon, rough. Second Coming, super exciting. So bear with me through the first part of this message. We'll get to the rest of it. But I just want to say this as we get started, that um, when Jesus came the first time, he came clothed in deep, deep humility. It's hard, it's hard maybe, maybe even impossible to get our minds around the depth of the humility of Christ in the first coming. Jesus lowered himself all the way below angels to become a human being. And not just a human being, but a baby. And, and not just a baby, but a baby born into a poor family, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. At his first coming, he came unnoticed by most of the world, surrounded by animals and shepherds. In his life, he went about doing good. He never accumulated any riches. Jesus never even owned a home, never even owned a bed. He walked everywhere he went, and he died hanging between two criminals and was buried in a borrowed tomb. But that's not the end of Jesus' story. We know that three days later, three days later, I'm telling you, oh, that grave opened up, the tomb, the stone rolled away. Oh, man. First fruits of the resurrection. First to receive a perfect human body. Now, even as we meet here this morning, as you and I sit here right now, Jesus Christ is glorified, sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That's where he is this morning. He's there. Now. He's there now, but he's coming back here. Jesus is coming back here. And when he comes, brothers and sisters, my friends, I'm telling you that when he comes the second time, it will not be like the first. It is not going to be clothed in deep humility. We are going to see him as he is. He is going to be clothed in the glory of the eternal God that is his right. And it is going to be a day. The Apostle John got to see it. They're in a imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos. As far as we know, he died there in exile. But he got to see the day of the Lord. And he wrote it down. Carried along by the Holy Ghost, he, he wrote it down for us. And through his writings, we get a chance to peek past just the brokenness and the, the captivity that we st we're exiles here. This world is not my home. I am just passing through. And one day my Jesus is coming back. This morning, you know, Evangeline, my daughter, you know, she's been, 
They've been having a lot of seizures lately since. And she just, this morning, she just had another just huge one. And we sat, this, just this, this morning, just a couple hours ago, we sat there on the, with her on the deck and Heather had a hold of her. And it was a big, long one. It was ugly. It's hard to watch. And he moans. And, and I'm trying to hold her head in a pillow to keep the sun off her face. And, and I'm just thinking, Jesus is coming. He's going to fix this. He's going to fix it. Boy, I'm looking forward to it. Look at verse 11 with me again, if you would. It says, I saw heaven opened. And I'm going to pray in just a minute. But I just love the Bible. such a cool book. Boy, I love the Bible. <laughs> and we have this incredible opportunity because these words are true. That this morning, we get the chance to see heaven opened too. By the eye of faith this morning, in my prayer for you, last night we prayed, and this morning I prayed, and I'm going to pray in just a moment. And the prayer is this, that by the eye of faith, we would see heaven opened. And when we see heaven opened, you know what we're going to see? A white horse. And he that sits on that horse is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this portion of Scripture. I thank you for letting us see through the veil here into the future. Thank you, God, for this vision that you gave John. Thank you for having him write it down. Thank you, God, for preserving it all these centuries. The century after century, you saved these words. So that we, this morning, could open them up and in our own language read the things that John saw. Lord, all of us, we need to see you in a new and a better way, a clearer way than we ever have before. God, our reasons vary. But Lord, I know there are people hurt. There are people in this room. There are people on the live stream. They're hurting for different reasons. God, for those that are hurting, I pray that as we see this vision of you, as we anticipate your return, God, that you would supply comfort, that you would give hope, Lord, for those that are weary, that as we consider your coming, that you would provide refreshment. God, for those that are broken and sad, that you would provide healing and joy. Lord, we pray that we would be changed by this, that this would not just be something where we learned some interesting stuff and went away. But God, that you would use these next moments that we have together to change us. God, we need it. So, Lord, we just turn the service over to you. Lord, help me. I'm not. God, I'm nothing. If this isn't you, it's a waste. So, please, speak whatever you want to speak. Say whatever you want to say. Do whatever you want to do. These are your people, and it's your service, and it's your book. So, we turn it over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to follow along in your bulletin this morning, you should have received one on your way in. If you're watching on the live stream, we attach that to the newsletter that goes out on Saturday, so you can print it out and follow along that way if you'd like to. Of course, you can just take notes, follow along however you'd like. We'll fill some blanks as we go. The sign this morning that we're going to be looking at, the sign... And I'll remind you that in this series, we've been looking at the sign and the warning and then the therefore. A sign harder to interpret, a little less clear. Christians that love Jesus and love their Bibles take some of these things differently than I've taken them. That's okay. I'm going to do my best. I, I'll tell you this sermon was a tough one. They've all been difficult. This one was especially bumpy. I got a whole outline done and I realized it was too much. It was too much. I know some of you think, God's been trying to tell you that for a while, preacher. 
Uh, <laughs> but, but I heard him this time. He was like, no, it's too much. And I was like, God, but it's done already. <laughs> so I ended up down at my prayer rock and that's where I go when I'm really desperate. And I was down there talking to the Lord and I came back and I started over. And so a lot of work went into this that all went away. This one came out instead. I think it's better. I think it's what the Lord wants. It's simpler. You heard me say simpler. You know that's different from simple. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts here. I've really done my best to try to understand this um, and to try to uh, put it in a way that's going to be understandable, but also useful. But if you'll bear with me through the sign, you're really going to like the warning and the therefore, I promise. Okay. So the sign this morning is about the campaign of Armageddon. And here's the interesting thing about this. Uh, as, we, as we put these pieces together there, as we try to understand what Armageddon is, and you'll notice I'm calling it a campaign. Often, when we think of Armageddon, the thing that jumps to mind is a final climactic battle. And that's true. There, there will be the final, the Bible says, climactic battle. But it's really more helpful when you're trying to understand all the scripture verses that deal with this to understand Armageddon as a campaign more than a battle. It's a series of battles. There is a series of army movements that happen, I believe, over the course of three and a half years. The, the, the campaign of Armageddon is a long-running battle that takes a while until it finally all comes to a head. And I'll hope to show you that a little bit as we look at the scriptures this morning. One of the things that makes this difficult is that there are, there are three key passages in the Bible that deal with Armageddon. There are, there are more than this. Joel, the, uh, a number of the other prophets deal with Armageddon. But the three key ones are in Revelation chapter 16 and Revelation chapter 19, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and Daniel 11. And here's the thing, and this is why your pastor went so far down the rabbit hole that he had to start over. There's a lot of detail in these passages, but they're missing parts. If you only had Ezekiel 38 and 39, you cannot figure it out. If you only have Daniel 11, you cannot figure it out. If you only have Revelation 16 and 19, you get the punchline, but you miss a lot of the detail. And so it's only when you start to try to put these puzzle pieces together that the whole thing starts to emerge in a clearer way. And I think that is pretty awesome. These people spoke different languages. They lived in entirely different parts of the world. They had no way to coordinate or communicate with each other. And yet when you line them up, the pieces all just click together. It's super, super cool. It's one of the things that's really miraculous about the Bible is this sort of thing happens a lot uh, in the Bible. So today we're going to be jumping around some between these passages as I try to help you snug these puzzle pieces together. So just fair warning, that's what's going to happen. All right. The next thing that we want to talk about is where we get this term Armageddon from, and it's named from the place Armageddon. Now, in the Greek there, it's Harmegiddo, right? Which is, is a little difficult to translate, but it, it, it means the hill or the mountain, the high place of Megiddo. Uh, Revelation chapter 16. Now, I know we've been in 19, but if you'll just flip a couple pages back, in my Bible, it's just a page. If you'll go back a page in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16, I want you to see this reference to it here. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13. I think maybe it's printed. Is it printed in your bulletin? It's printed in the bulletin. Okay. Revelation 16, 13 says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For these are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together in a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. So this is the place where at the very end, so you'll, you'll, you'll recall, this is the sixth uh, seal. This is almost the very end. The spirits of the great river Euphrates has been dried up. The frog spirits come out of the mouths of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. They go to the kings of the earth and they gather them together to this place, Armageddon, right? Armageddon, the hill of Megiddo. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what is this place, because it's, it's a real place. 
Uh, it's not, this is not some mystical thing that's difficult to understand. You can go visit there. Did you guys get to visit? Yeah. So my parents went to the, Je so this is the Jezreel Valley, where, which is Megiddo, which is where uh, Armageddon is. And that's Mount Tabor there in the center. Uh, Nazareth is sort of off to the left. Uh, I'll show you a map. But this is the valley. This is what it looks like um, looking uh, basically north here. Um, so here's a map of it on, on Israel. So you can see uh, the Mediterranean Sea is there on the left. The Sea of Galilee on the right. Um, and then the Dead Sea down at the bottom. So Jerusalem, further down, closer to the Dead Sea, the West Bank. So Megiddo is right there, just kind of below Nazareth. So that's sort of where you're at. It's a real place you can go visit. Uh, I recommend you go now, not later. All right, that's a, that's a little end times joke for you. Okay, so... This is a topographical map of it that I thought was pretty interesting just to kind of help you give, get a little bit of a feel of what it looks like. So, so the Mediterranean Sea in this picture is at the bottom. So we're looking east here in this picture, the Jezreel Valley. It's sort of interesting, Mount Carmel, you know, where Elijah called down fire onto the mountains. Mount Carmel is right there. The Megiddo Fortress, which is labeled there sort of in the middle, that's, that's Har Megiddo. That's the hill of Megiddo. It's an incredibly strategic point from there it's the, it's the ideal command position over the Jezreel Valley. And so multiple forces, uh, fortresses have been built there over the centuries in the ruins. And they build another fortress on top of those ruins. And that's just sort of how it goes in that part of the world. So Mount Tabor is there, which is a big hill you could see in that first picture. Uh, Nazareth is there. When it tells you that Mary and Joseph went up to Nazareth, that's why, because it's up. They had to come through the Jezreel Valley and go up to, or, or they can down, but in any case. So Jerusalem's there at the far edge of the map, Jordan River Valley. Okay, so that's the sort of layout of it. Um, so this place is an incredibly strategic place. Um, because of the topography of it, because of the big wide open field, because this is such an important part of the world, a thoroughfare, so much trade and international traffic and warfare has gone through there. Control of this area has always been enormously important through history. Lots of important battles were fought there. Uh, a quick highlight of those for you. So Deborah and Barak, this is the valley where they defeated the Canaanites. If you're familiar with that story, it's in Judges uh, chapter 4 and 5. Um, also in Judges 7, this is where Gideon defeated the Midianites. Remember the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon? They smashed the torches. This is, this is where that happened. Um, this is where Solomon fought against Egypt, uh, was here in this valley and defeated them. This valley is where King Saul was killed by the Philistines. One of the great tragedies, the first king of Israel, the first king of Israel died at the hands of the Philistines in this valley. He's not, he was not the only king of Israel to die there. King Josiah died there in battle with the Egyptians. Um, but, and so, and then, and much, much more. But that's sort of a highlight of what we find in the biblical record, why this valley is a significant place. But many battles are there. There are over 34 major battles in history, post-Bible times, that have been fought there. Saladin and the Crusaders fought in this valley four separate times, depending on who was in control of Jerusalem and the Holy Land at that time. So when you think about the Crusades, lots of the major battles of the Crusades happened right there in this valley. Uh, the Egyptians uh, fought the Mongols there. <laughs> uh, that was in uh, the 14th century um, when Egypt was in control of that and the Mongols invaded. There was a massive battle at that point. Napoleon fought there. Napoleon fought and defeated the Ottomans in the Jezreel Valley uh, here at Armageddon. We're going to come back to that in a moment. This is also where the British finally finished off the Ottomans, the Ottoman Turks, in World War I was here in the Jezreel Valley. And this also Israel and the Arab Liberation Army fought a battle here shortly after the creation of the state of Israel here in the Jezreel Valley. Now, that's not an accident that there's been that much bloodshed there. It's hard to calculate these things. There have been bloodier battles than battles that were fought here. But when you start adding up all the battles throughout history that have been fought in this valley, this is a contender for maybe the bloodiest battlefield in the world. It's certainly up there if it's not number one. Napoleon said this. I like this quote. And I don't know if he knew that he was speaking prophecy or not. I, don't, I doubt it. Napoleon said, All the armies of the world could maneuver their forces on this vast plain. It is the most natural battleground of the whole earth. 
Now, Napoleon knew a thing or two about choosing battlefields. And he identified this one as maybe the best place in the world to fight a battle. Who's awake this morning? Because the Bible says that the frog spirits are going to go out to the kings of the earth and deceive them and gather them together for battle where? Right here. At Har Megiddo. Okay. So this is coming. But it raises an interesting question. We've talked about this a little bit in the sermon series so far. So I'm not going to belabor it this morning. But you'll notice that there are kings of the earth that are gathered together to battle here. Oftentimes when people who are only a little familiar with the Bible, they've heard about the Antichrist, they've heard that he's like a one-world ruler, something like that, and they have this idea that the whole world is ruled by one person. And that's, that's not the Bible's presentation of the Antichrist. That's not the beast. That's not what he does. And we've talked about that quite a lot in this sermon series. Um, but I want to just explain a little bit more what the final political shape of the world looks like as described by the Bible. The reason I want to do that is because it sounds a lot like today. It's real creepy. Like the division of power that the Bible says is going to exist at the end, we're getting really close to a division of power in the world today that looks just like this. It makes me scared and excited. <laughs> All right. So what are the final world powers? So there it is. The one that we've talked the most about is the revived Roman Empire. This is the direct kingdom of the beast. This is what he rules over. It's the ten toes. It's the ten horns. There are ten kings. They give their power to the beast. He wipes out three of them and consolidates power over that. It's, it's clearly a revived Roman Empire. There's lot, it's headquartered in Rome. There's lots of the, the Bible gives us the most detail about this kingdom. It's the final world power. It's the greatest power in the world. And it's the one that is the final times of the Gentiles over Israel, right? So, so that's it. It's certainly Western Europe. It, it almost has to be that. It's, it includes Rome for sure. And it's hard to say what else. The British are trying to get out, but I don't know if they're going to make it. <laughs> and then you'll see that I've got in a lighter gray uh, North America, you know, America, Canada, Mexico, People talk about, well, where is America in the end times? I don't think we're going to matter as much as we Americans would like to think we're going to matter. And, and that's exactly right. You can already start to see it coming, can't you? It makes me really sad. I, I, I love this country. I, I do. I'm, I wake up every day grateful to be an American. But I'm telling you, America is coming apart at the seams. We, 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 are, we are living, whether Jesus comes or not, we are living in the last days of the Republic. Republics don't last this long. We, America, is the world record holder for the longest lasting Republic. A Republic's never lasted as long as it has here. We're past our expiration date. It cannot, the center cannot hold, it's coming apart. Now, God can send revival, somebody say amen. amen. And, and if you're not praying for a revival, then you are not being a good citizen. If you want to be a good citizen of America, vote and pray for revival. And I don't know what else to tell you. Um, I think as America goes down, that it makes it likely that whenever, whatever this final revived Roman Empire power is, that we're folded in with that, that we're a part of that. That's my guess. Or else things are so bad here. Now, I'll tell you what I want to have happen. You want to hear what your pastor wants to have happen? I want, when the rapture happens, I want this whole continent empty. I want so many people to be Christians that when the rapture happens, there's nobody left to keep the lights on in America. That's what I want to have happen. And the reason we're not in prophecy is because everybody's gone, praise God. So VBS, soul winning, harvest party, let's do it, amen? Let's go tell them. All right. I mean, people everywhere, but you know. Right. So that's the revived Roman Empire. So that's, that's the preeminent power. They're the ones that are, they're going to make the peace treaty with Israel. Um, and... They're going to have, and the, one of the reasons people get confused in thinking of the beast as a global leader is because he has authority over global commerce and he's at the head of the world religion. 
So he does exercise enormous global power. So the false prophet causes the world to worship the beast, and the beast makes it so that you cannot buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. So he has enormous control over global finance, he has enormous control over uh, the global religious system, and he has an actual political power base for sure in Western Europe. Now let me ask you a question. At the time that this was written, the idea that a king of one country could control the commerce of other countries was probably a very hard to understand idea. For thousands of years, Bible-believing Christians have read this and have been confused. How can a king in one country control the commerce of other kings in other countries? How many of you know that that's no longer hard to imagine how that could work? It's already basically what's going on. It is already what is basically going on. It just hasn't been fully consolidated yet. That's it. And so, and guess what? If one power group was going to control global commerce today, where would you expect that control to come from? From the West. We built all the systems of international trade. We control all the major isthmus of the West, Western powers in general. We do that now. The banking system, all of it's under control of Western powers. And guess where the Bible says the base operations are going to be headquartered out of? Out of the Western powers. I'm telling you, what, what was always in the Bible has been there. You find the oldest copies of the Bible you can. It's exactly the same as what we're reading today. But now it's like, here it comes. Here it comes. But the, but the Antichrist, the beast, only directly controls this ten-toed empire, whatever the extent of it happens to be. There's another great power. The other great power, the Bible says, is going to be the Northern Alliance. The Northern Alliance. It's described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's described in Daniel 11. It's described in Joel chapter 2. It's described in Isaiah 10, Isaiah 30, and Isaiah 31. The Bible has a lot to say about this Northern Alliance. It's one of the great powers that opposes itself. It's a check on the power of the beast and the power of the Western Empire. Which again, if there was going to be major opposition to the West, where do we think that politically, where might that come from? Well, and we're getting there. And, and Russia and her allies. Um, we'll look at it more in a minute, but I just want you to hear Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, and the land of Magog, and the chin chief prince Mushk and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Here's the interesting thing about that. Say Gog, Magog, Meshk, what are we talking about? Those words, if you follow, if you trace the lineage of them through, you can actually find some of these words in Russian places. In fact, the prince, the chief prince there is Rosh. That's the actual Hebrew for it, is, is Rosh. And Mushk is actually a very old word for Moscow. I mean, these are the words that are right here in the Bible. It's, it's, if you just follow the genealogies, it's really easy to identify these as speaking about Russia. So or what we today would call Russia. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, and the chief prince of Mershk and Tubal, and I, the chief prince of Moscow and Tubal. I will turn thee back, and I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring them forth, and all thine army and horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields and handling swords. And here's the interesting thing. So here's, here comes Russia, which does not have control of global finance, but does have a massive army. But look who comes with them. Ver uh, you can't look, but I'll tell you. Persia, uh, Ethiopia, Libya, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands. The house Torgma of the northern quarters and all his bands. And many people with thee. So Russia heads this big alliance, which at various points in history has been an odd thing to think about. Today, we recognize that this is the political situation. There's developing these different power blocks in the world. One of them, very headed by Russia. The countries that are falling into their circle, it's also interesting. The Bible identifies Persia, which is today we would call Iran. Guess who Iran is very much in bed with today? Once upon a time, Iran and Russia being allies, hard to imagine. Today, it's basically already true. One of the ones here is Gomer. It's a little hard to identify Gomer. It appears to maybe be Germany. That one's odd. If the Germans start getting really cozy with the Russians, buckle your seatbelts. 
It's possible that it has more in mind in Eastern, some of the Eastern countries, which if that's true, the Russian takeovers in the Ukraine and things like that start to make a lot more sense that maybe that's actually Goma. Torgma, Turkey, Armenia, same thing. Turkey was kind of moving towards the West. Turkey in recent days has made a hard shift and they're heading back towards uh, Russia, Armenia, others. They're going to attempt an invasion of Israel in the end times. That's, the passages in Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah are talking about the Northern Alliance's invasion of Israel that is yet to happen, but is going to come. The third big power is the king of the, of the south. The Bible calls them the kings of the south. It's mostly in Daniel chapter 11. We know less about them. Daniel 11:40. at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. They're less powerful. They're allied with Russia and the Russian alliance. They don't have as much power. They, it clearly includes Egypt. When you study the passages, you'll see that Egypt is for sure a part of this. The other ones, it's harder to say. Probably Saudi Arabia, probably some of the North African countries. It's a little bit more difficult to identify. But there's kings of the south that are a major power broker. Again, broadly what we'd expect. The last one are the kings of the east. We know the least about these biblically. They're mentioned most prominently in Revelation 16. We just read it or a couple weeks ago. The sixth angel poured his vial on the great river Euphrates. The water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Again, here it's China, maybe India. It's hard to say exactly who that is, but they're the kings from the east. So these are the power blocks that the Bible says are going to exist at the end. These are the major players and what do you notice about that map? Our world is dividing off into these are the power blocks. It's the world is starting to look very much like this map that you can draw this map just from reading your Bible or from reading the news. Yeah, uh oh, it's right. Okay, so what's going to happen? Here's the campaign of Armageddon. And I'm going to do this as simply as I can. Like I said, there's lots of moving parts of this, but I'm going to, we're going to do a really high-level overview of it. If you want to do more, I've given you lots of the Scripture references. You can go, I mean, the Bible actually has, like, movements and which countries are going to, like, slide through the cracks and where he's going to come from and surprisingly detailed information. For a while, all that was in the sermon. <laughs> but it occurred to me that much of that is for the benefit of the people who live through it. Because if you're caught in the crosshairs here, you need to know where to escape. I mean, just, I mean, just think about this for a minute. There are going to be people who live through this. The armies are coming in from the north. They're coming in from the south. Where do we go? There's a book that's going to be 2,000 years old that's going to tell you where to go and hide. I mean, I think, I mean, I think that's pretty awesome. But not us. A, we don't live over there. Please don't plan any trips. But B, we're going in the rapture. Somebody say amen. All right. I, I do not plan to be here for any of this. Okay. So I figured I can spare you the details of where to go and hide. The correct place to hide is in Jesus. Just hide there. Okay. So the invasion from the north and south. So, so here is a, a satellite map of the Middle East. So we'll highlight Israel for you. So Israel is smaller than New Jersey. Uh, right there. So there it is in the Middle East. Um, and so they're going to get invaded from the north and from the south. Now, obviously, this doesn't even show the scope because the northern powers stretch way up there off into the north. But so there's uh, Turkey, Armenia, which is pretty clearly identified, Iran, which is clearly identified, Russia, which is clearly identified. And so there, those are the sort of the political map of what's going to be surrounding Israel here at this point. Ezekiel 38, 14. It's there in your outline. It's the invasion from the north and the south. Ezekiel 38, 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog. It's a little bit more preamble. It says, thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, a mighty army. And thou shalt come against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. So, this uh, invasion of this scale has never happened from the north into Israel. It's going to happen in the end times. And then Daniel 11.40. At the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. Now, this is a little controversial. It's in brackets. I want you to know that brackets, this is your pastor, not the Bible. 
There are some people who have a slightly different interpretation of who him is here, but I'm telling you what the right interpretation is. <laughs> I'm telling you mine. Just I want you to know that bracket means it's me, not the Bible, but I think it's right. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him, push at the beast, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships. So Daniel describes this event. Ezekiel describes this event. We see it happening in Revelation. What is it? There's an invasion that comes from the north and from the south at the nation of Israel. Now, why is this happening? Just a couple of thoughts I want to share. First of all, at the start of the seven-year tribulation, the beast does what? What starts the seven-year tribulation? If you've been here, you know the answer. It's the peace treaty. It's a seven-year peace treaty. So Israel... The way that Ezekiel describes the state of Israel at the time of the invasion is like this. It's in, it's in Ezekiel 38, 11. Ezekiel says they'll be living in unwalled villages that are at rest, that dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. Does that sound like Israel today? <laughs> That's the opposite of Israel today. What on earth could happen to make Israel be living at rest without bars and gates, without walls? I'll tell you what, a peace treaty with the most powerful nation in the world that's guaranteed their safety. And they're going to take that false peace and they're going to cry, peace and safety. Part of the peace treaty is probably going to be some kind of disarmament. And they're going to lay down their weapons and they're going to lay down their defenses and they're going to say, we have peace and the beast has brought us peace. And many of you are going to worship him as the, and the false prophet as the Messiah. And so they're going to say, peace and safety. But then what's going to happen? The king of the south is going to push at him. What's Israel going to do with this peace treaty? One of the things that we know for sure from the Bible that they're going to do with this peace treaty is they're going to rebuild the temple. We know that the temple is going to be standing by the midpoint, by three and a half years of the tribulation, there's going to be a temple. Now, right now, the Dome of the Rock, uh, there's, a, there's a mosque, a Muslim mosque that sits in the historic site of the temple. There's already really fascinating evidence that that's wrong, that that's not actually where the temple's supposed to be. A lot of really, really compelling research. Brother Steve loaned me a book, really excellent research by these archaeologists that say, you know what, they've got the space wrong. And as they continue to dig, they're, gonna, they're identifying where the temple actually ought to go. What I think is going to happen, and it's increasingly clear that this is broadly the course it's going to take. The Antichrist is going to make a deal. He's going to say, we're going to guarantee your peace. You're going to lay down your weapons. We're going to make peace in the Middle East. And we're going to let you rebuild the temple. And you can build it somewhere else there. And they're going to take him up on the deal. What do you think the reaction of the Muslim world is going to be to Israel not having any defenses and building their temple? What do you think the reaction is going to be? Maybe... The king of the south is going to push at him? Duh. Because here's easy pickings. This thing they've been... You know that in most of these Middle Eastern countries, these kings of the south, Israel's not even on the map. It's illegal to have a map that shows the state of Israel on it. They, they, they've wanted this country gone for forever. And if they, are, if they make a deal with the infidels and they're rebuilding their temple and they've dropped their defenses... I just don't think it takes a lot of imagination to think that this is exactly what's going to happen. The king of the south is going to push at them. And they're going to think they've got this alliance that, that Russia has told them, you do it, we got your back. And so they're going to go in for, for, and, and invade, which is going to provoke the invasion from the west. Going to provoke the invasion from the west. Who's that? Well, that's the beast and his armies. He's going to come in I think it's going to be to defend. Now, if you're just listening to this sermon, no, I'm doing big, sarcastic air quotes to defend Israel from the kings of the south. And so here comes the beast in to save Israel from the kings of the south and the invasion. Look at what it says in Daniel 11:40. And he, the beast, now this is the extended continuum of the verse. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. And he, the beast, shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. He's going to come in in defense, 
but then he's going to go on a conquering rampage as he does it. Uh, Daniel, if you read it in Daniel, you'll see in Daniel 11 specifically, the beast is going to capture Egypt for sure. That's one of the reasons we know that Egypt's a part of this alliance, because he's going to conquer Egypt. He's going to start out defending Israel, but he's going to conquer Egypt and many of the other southern kings. He's going to take over. So that's why I think it probably includes Saudi Arabia and some of these other North African countries. The Daniel 11 names some of the countries he's going to conquer. They're a little hard to identify. They're ancient names for those peoples. It's a little hard to trace to the present thing. But in any case, he's going to come in from the west into Israel. He's going to overflow. He's going to enter the glorious land. He's going to overflow and many countries will be overthrown. I think this probably leads us, um, I think I got some points for this. So yeah, Beast invades armies to defend it. There are those sarcastic air quotes. I think this is probably the midweek. Because Daniel 9 says that the beast makes his treaty with Israel for a week. But in the midst of the week, three and a half years in, he causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations. Right? It's the abomination of desolations. Happens at the middle of the week. It stands to reason, to me, that he's violated this peace treaty under the guise of defending them. And now he's basically taken over. Instead of defending Israel, now he's ruling it. And he's going to go into the temple and declare himself to not just be God, but to be better than God, the abomination of desolations. That's the warning to Israel. Jesus spoke to his to his brethren, and he said, when you see it happen, don't go back for your coats. If you're out in the field, don't go home. Get out. Get to the mountains. Because, and you'll see, it's not only just that the beast is taken over, as said, uh, the, the invasion from the south, I think, has probably already started, but then what's happening next is here comes the kings from the north, and God is going to miraculously destroy them. And again, it's hard to put the timeline exactly together because the verses that talk about one don't always talk about the other. But in Ezekiel 39, which is talking about the invasion of the kings of the north, it says that God is going to destroy the northern invaders. It's there in your outline, Ezekiel 39, 2 and 5. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee. I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand. I will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. This massive northern invasion, the Bible says that God's going to knock their arrow, the bow out of their hands, knock their arrows down, and he's going to ruin them on the mountains of Israel. So this is some sort of miraculous intervention that destroys the northern invasion. My personal theory is that this helps set up the beast's abomination of desolations. Something miraculous is going to happen to those northern invaders. How are they going to explain that? I think the answer is going to be the beast. He's going to say, I've saved Israel. I'm your Messiah. I have defended you. I knock them out of the sky and crash them into the mountains. Not only am I God, I'm better than him. I think these events probably all are around the same time. That's my guess. The beast, after all this, uh, so God miraculously destroys the northern invaders. I think, do, is that a blank in your outline or I don't know? I want to make sure you get all these blanks filled in. So God miraculously destroys the northern invaders. And then the beast moves his headquarters to Israel. That's in Daniel 11, 44. And this is really interesting. Remember these, I know it's like, you're jumping around so much, but you have to, <laughs> to put the pieces together. Daniel eleven forty four. but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. So he's on a rampage. He's unstoppable. He's wiped out the kings of the south. He's conquered a bunch of their countries. The, the armies of the north have been destroyed, but I think that's the tidings out of the north that have disturbed him because he knows he didn't do it. But then something happens out of the east. Daniel doesn't tell us what. Daniel just says tidings from the east disturb the beast. And so in reaction to this, Daniel 11.45, the beast shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So he moves his headquarters, his palace from Rome. At this point in the tribulation, from Rome, he moves his headquarters to Israel. What are the tidings out of the east, you ask? 
Well, it's the invasion from the east. Israel's getting in big trouble at this point. They've been invaded from the south. They've been invaded from the north. They've been defended slash invaded from the west. And now here comes another army. Who is it? It's the kings of the east. Why are the kings of the east coming? Revelation 16, 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial on the great river Euphrates and the waters thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. If China starts moving forces, right, the Euphrates dries up. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The Chinese are already heavily investing into the Euphrates River Basin. They're working on a bunch of dam and sanitation projects. There's Belt and Road Initiative. They're pouring a ton of money into the Middle East. They're building ports here along, along the southern uh, end through the, through the Emirates. Tons of money going in here. What do you think the Chinese reaction is going to be if the Western powers all of a sudden now are in control of Israel, probably in control of Saudi Arabia, in control of Iran? They've wiped out the armies of the Iranians and the Russians. Now there's no more buffer. The armies of the Northern Alliance have been destroyed. The kings of the South have been put down. The beast is large and in charge in the Middle East. What do you think the Chinese reaction to that is going to be? And when the Euphrates dries up all the way, they've got investments at risk there. They've already got the bases all along the, all along the, the horn there, ready to move in. The drying of the Euphrates rivers prepares the way of the kings of the east. When the Chinese start rolling their troops in, into Iraq, that, those are tidings from the east that are going to trouble the beast. Exactly what Daniel said was going to happen. It's going to motivate him to move his headquarters into Israel, to be present right there, to try to check whatever it is the Chinese are up to. Zechariah 14 puts it like this. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Brothers and sisters, I just want to say to you this morning, uh, some of this, I've done the best I can to understand what the Bible prophecies say about how this is all going to come together. I'm not sure that I've got all the details right, but I'll tell you this. God said he's going to gather all nations of the world to battle against Jerusalem. And when you put these puzzle pieces together, what you find is through a series of things that are very easy to understand how it could happen, that this is exactly the situation we're going to end up with, where the great powers of the world are encamped around this one tiny little spot. And that all the nations of the world are going to end up arrayed to battle against Jerusalem. It may not happen exactly like this, but the outcome is this. This is where it ends up. But there's one more invasion. There's one more. And we say, well, who's left? The north's invading, the south's invading, the west's invading, the east's invading. What other possible direction can you be invaded from? Up. Finally, this morning, it's the invasion from heaven. <laughs> Woo! All right. I told you the end of the message is good. I'm getting excited. Here it comes. And I want you to say that this, that this final invasion, this is the good one. This is the one we're waiting for. Boy, I'm excited about this. Now, I plan to be behind Jesus on a horse when this happens, just to be clear. <laughs> but, but this... this the, the prophets have been looking forward to this. Jesus has been looking forward to this day. I want you to see what Jesus said about it. It's in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus warning about the end times. This is what Jesus had to say. Jesus said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. If you want nightmares or to understand what that means, you can listen to the sermon on the tribulation judgments. All right. And then Jesus said, immediately, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Remember the great earthquake and the temple in heaven. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. For they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. All the tribes of the earth, they're gathered together 
And they're there to fight each other. But then the sign of the Son of Man is going to appear in heaven. And they're all going to mourn. Because remember, they've been warned. The two witnesses warned them. The 144,000 warned them. The angel flying through the heavens warned them. They've lived through drinking blood. They've lived through terrible boils on the mark of the beast. Now, not all of them have lived through it, but two-thirds of them have. They've lived through the shakings. They've lived through the darkening of the skies. They've lived through wormwood and the destruction of the grass, the fall of Babylon, the end of global commerce. And through it all, they have stuck with the beast. They have stuck with themselves. They have not repented. They have not changed their mind. And they are gathered together on the plains of Megiddo to fight to see who's going to control the cinder husk of a world that's left. And then, and then, the sign of the Son of Man appears in heaven. And they mourn because everything they've done is turned to ash, but here he comes with power and with glory and they know they're in trouble. <laughs> no repentance, mourning, they're sad about it, but they still don't change their minds. Zechariah, the prophet, hundreds of years even before Christ wrote this, he said, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city will go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. That's why Jesus said, when you see the abomination, get out. Don't, because when the beast's armies roll into Jerusalem, oh, they're there to defend. Yeah. But they're going to loot the houses. They're going to rape the women. This is not a good army. But there are some, will, some will remain. Some are going to survive. And then it says, But then shall the Lord go forth, and he'll fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will cleave in the midst thereof, towards the east and towards the west. And there'll be a great valley. That Mount of Olives, Jesus ascended from it up into heaven, and he's going to come back, and he's going to put his feet on it, and he's going to break it in half. I'm telling you, when the Bible says that Jesus is coming in power and great glory, he means it. He's going to hit the earth with such a thud, it's going to break a mountain in two. Right. Oh, you're not going to miss it when he comes back, I'm telling you. You know that superhero landing they do in the movies, and boom, and they like, you know, you get the little on the ground. I got nothing on Jesus. Now you want to talk about a superhero landing, this is the real deal right here. Break a mountain in half and then we'll talk, okay. So here comes the invasion from heaven. But let's look at what Revelation, uh, th this, this morning I want to ramp up. So Revelation 19 gives us my favorite picture of the second coming. There's much, much, there's so much scripture that deals with the second coming. But this is, this is my favorite here in Revelation 19. It makes me emotional every time I read it. And I want you to see it this morning. We're going to make our application and be done. But Revelation 19, look at what it says. And I saw heaven opened. Boy, we just, we need it. Because hell's been unleashed here on earth. And this is as close to hell as I ever want to get. Amen. And if you're saved, this is as close as you ever have to get. I want to see heaven opened. Because that's where my Jesus is. In Acts, there's a couple of visions where people get to see heaven open. And when they see it, they see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. Or in the case of Stephen's martyrdom, they see him standing at the right hand of the Father. He gets the standing ovation, the first martyr of the church in that glory. But this time when heaven's opened, 
He's not seated. He's not standing. He's mounted up for battle. He's on his horse. People sometimes say there are going to be animals in heaven. Well, there's at least horses. (laughs) I saw heaven open and I behold a white horse. And he that sat on him was called Faithful. I love every name of Jesus. They all tell us something really wonderful about him. But given what I've been through in my life, and given what many of you have been through in your lives, these have to be top three. Faithful. Because I'm, I'm not. I go up and down and I... I doubt and I wonder. I'm filled with fear about things I I know better. But he isn't just faithful. His name is faithful. And I'm so tired of all the lies. I'm so tired of all the lies. I just don't, I read things and I just think, who even knows? hard to know what to even believe. But I believe Jesus because he's true. He's faithful and he's true. Oh man. And he's coming back. He's coming on a horse. And he's coming in righteousness. And he's coming to make war. Some people, you know, it's a scary thing. Until you realize just sometimes the only solution is you just got to put the bad guys into the ground. And it's reached that point. The cups, Jesus is unbelievably long-suffering. But once the long-suffering ends, it's time to put the bad guys in the ground. And he's coming to do it. It's not your job to do it. It's not my job to do it. Sometimes, (laughs) Journey, I told her, I said, if any guy, if any guy ever messes with you, Uh, We have 10 acres and I have a shovel. (laughs) And and I will go to jail. You just let me know. (laughs) But it's not my job. I mean, I would, but I shouldn't. (laughs) You all come visit me in prison. (laughs) But Jesus is going to do it. Because somebody needs to. And he's the one who can righteously do it. If I would do it, it would be unrighteous. But he can do it righteously. Look at the description of him. That babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, surrounded by shepherds and manure who never even owned a bed, hung naked to die on a cross between thieves. Only thing he owned was some scraps of clothes and they gambled for it while he died. Look at him now. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. I'm glad. The Bible, you know, names are a big deal in the Bible. They're a big deal in the Bible. And some of the names, the Bible says there are some songs that only the people that went through that thing can sing that song. I believe, you know, the Bible's not super clear on that, but I I believe that for the things that Heather and I have been through with Evangeline, that there is a song for special needs parents. And there's going to be a choir, and you can't join unless you had a special needs kid. Because you don't know the words. Because here we can sing. We can sing whatever we want here. We can sing, I surrender all, and not mean it at all. In heaven, you can't sing it if you don't mean it. There are going to be songs that you know that I'm not going to be able to sing. The Bible says Jesus is going to give us each a name. Not the name your parents gave you. I'm not against your parents, but they were sinners. (laughs) Jesus is going to give you a name. But those names are going to reflect who you are. Really, who you are. 
And Jesus has a name. He went through something we'll never really understand. And so he's got a name that nobody knows but him. But I'm glad because he deserves that. And he's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Our garments are white and clean, made white by the blood of the Lamb, but his has a reminder that it's his blood that made us clean. And his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. By him all things were made. Apart from him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And here he is on a white horse. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. I need to learn to ride. I plan to be there. I, I, I'm not sure that's us. I hope so. They're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We know that the saints, we know that you and I, the saved, we're going to get robes white and clean. I, we're going to get the uniform. I hope we get the horse too. We'll see. Uh, don't, you say, well, I don't know how to fight either. Don't worry about that. Jesus is going to take care of the fighting. But we're a lot of unnecessary backup. All right. Verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That's in two weeks. That's the millennial reign. In two Sundays, we're going to talk about the millennial reign, about his ruling the nations with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. And this name we know, this name we know, this name we love it, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. That's Jesus. I'm telling you, here comes Jesus. He's the king, and he's not just the king. He's the king of kings, and he's not just the Lord. He's the Lord of lords. He is the great potente. He is the ruler of time. He is faithful, and he is true, and he is coming back. Amen. I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, and he said to all the fowls, to every bird that flies in the midst of heaven, Come, gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and those that sit on them, and the flesh of men, free and bond, small and great. God says, I've made a mess, birds, come eat. Oh, boy. And these people who were too proud, too good for Jesus, too good to repent, so full of themselves, so sure of themselves, so reliant on their own strength and their own might, chickens are going to eat them. And I saw the beast, verse 19, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and his army. Now they're there to fight each other, but when they see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, they say, how about we join forces and get rid of this guy, which is what they've wanted all along. It's a dumb decision and it doesn't last very long. They gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, that which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. We'll talk a little bit about that in, two we or in three weeks. Uh, the lake of fire is a little bit different than hell. It's crea it was created for the devil and his angels, but the first two people to go there are people. It's the beast and the false prophet. Verse 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. It's a quick battle. The people talk about the battle of Armageddon. It's the mother of all battles. And it is, but it's also quick and one-sided. All right, so here's the application, the end of the sermon this morning. So we've talked about the sign. I've done the best I can to the best of my ability, the best of my knowledge, to try to lay this out the way I think it's going to go. Some people have some different takes. That's okay. But the warning, I want to say to you, the warning is biblically very, very clear. There's no fuzziness about the warning today. And for the therefore that comes afterwards, there's also no fuzziness about this. Both of these are biblically very clear. If you believe your Bible even a little, both of these are clearly true. Here it is. The warning is that Jesus will return. Jesus 
will return. He's coming back. The Bible warned us in the last days, scoffers would come saying, where is he? Where is he? They're going to have a different reaction when he arrives. They're going to say, no, not yet. <laughs> Acts 1, this is Christ's ascension. So he's been resurrected. He spent weeks with his apostles, showed himself alive to hundreds of people who witnessed Christ after his resurrection, gave testimony to the resurrection with their own lives. And then after that, he goes up onto the Mount of Olives. Verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And all they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? <laughs> I love the questions of the Bible. I mean, you just got to imagine, Jesus is killed, you watch him die, he's buried, he's dead for three days, you're thinking about quitting, you go back to fishing maybe. Turns out he's alive. The women come. They say, guess what? We went to the tomb. He's not there. There's an angel. He lives. You're like, Mary, Martha, you need to lay off the sauce. <laughs> Until Jesus finally shows up and appears to them. Slow to believe. But then they get to spend this time with Jesus and they eat with him. And they fellowship with them and he teaches them. But he's not staying. So they go to the Mount of Olives, just a few, just the inner circle. And after telling them the last things, tell them to wait in Jerusalem until they get the Holy Spirit, the, the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And he goes up into the clouds. That's what, what would you do? There he goes. I mean, like, people don't normally do that. I mean, you just lived through a resurrection, so, you know, fine, but. I'd stand there and keep looking like he said he's coming back. Like, <laughs> So finally, here come the two men in white apparel. They say, hey, why are you staring at... Jesus gave you stuff to do, remember? Yeah. Now, they're slightly nicer than that, but that's the gist of it. It's like, hey, quit staring off into space. Jesus gave you jobs? Shoo! That's a paraphrase, but look at it. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. Just like you watch him go up into the clouds into heaven, he's going to come down out of the clouds back. So go get busy. What's the warning? Well, it depends a little bit on which side of Jesus you're on. Jesus will return. Is that a warning to be busy or is it a warning to get on the right side of the army? Listen, if you're enlisted in the wrong army, it's not too late to change sides. Amen. And what's the therefore? This morning, here's the therefore. And we're done. Jesus will return! <laughs> Jesus will return! I'm telling you, Jesus is coming back. Do you know this morning that Jesus is coming back? I know I'm a little... Hard to contain this morning. It's been a rough week. I'm just telling you, I'm just so excited. I'm so excited that he's coming back. Because we need him. Because we need him. You know, my testimony, you know, I, uh, my faith was almost destroyed by my daughter's uh, illness. And not even so much the illness, but just her her suffering. It's just real hard for me to watch her suffer. And, uh, and it just seems like God should fix it. And we did all the things that I thought the Bible said we were supposed to do. You know, I mean, like I was like, I teach in Sunday school and we're faithful givers. And if the church doors were open, we were here. And we laid hands on her and prayed for her and anointed her with oil. And she's on all these people's prayer chains and stuff. And, and not, not only has she not gotten better, she's just gotten worse. It keeps getting worse. And, uh, and so it almost destroyed my faith. I, 
I remember thinking, I'm not sure that I believe these things anymore. And it happened, it was like, it was kind of like a dam breaking. It was like all that doubt and fear and just disappointment with God and with my life just built up and built up and built up until one night when I kind of finally started saying, do I really believe this? It's like I pulled that first brick kind of out of the wall and then the water started to come through and all the, and it just started to like kind of collapse in a hurry. And I remember thinking, I don't, I don't know if I believe this stuff anymore. I don't know if I believe that God answers prayer. I don't really, and I know that like the Bible teaches that. And so I'm like, I'm not sure if I really believe all the stuff that the Bible says. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm really sure that there's like a heaven of like, are all people, I mean, we're just so afraid of death. Like maybe people just, you know, cause like I got a, you know, like I got, I mean, it wasn't true then, but now, you know, I have a kid and he's like, oh, you know, you know, the animal died. Are we going to see it again? And like, you know, you want to make them feel better. And it's like, is that all this is? Is it somewhere along the line, somebody, their kid was scared. And so they told them a story to make them feel better about it. I'm like, what if that's all this is? And it's just really old. And so it seems mystical somehow. And all just started to kind of fall down. And uh, I ended up all the way down at, like, what about Jesus? And you understand, like, you know, I've been saved for a long time. I, man, it's, it's weird. It's, you know, Jesus had answered a lot of my prayers. I'd seen Jesus do amazing things. I knew were him. I, I had a front row seat to miracles. I'd watched him change my parents' life. But like when you're just grieving and broken, like you forget all that stuff. The only thing I could remember was the wormwood and the gall and the bitterness. And, and for a while, it seems like that's all there is. And then uh, I was thinking, you know, if I really believed in the resurrection or not, like I think that actually happened. And this wonderful thing happened. As I sat there, I just, I couldn't believe that they made it up. I couldn't believe that it didn't happen. So I was like, I discovered almost to my own surprise <laughs> that I believed that Jesus rose from the dead. I think that really happened. I don't know what to tell you people. I think it really happened. I think he really did. I, I, I think he, I think he did. <laughs> I think he rose from the dead. And I just thought, okay, now what? In John 14, 1, Jesus said this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And you've heard me share this before if you've come to church for a while here, but I just, that was it for me. After I bounced off the resurrection, it was like going down a dark well. But there's a rock down there, the resurrection, and I hit it and I bounced. After I bounced, I thought, you know, Jesus said, that if it weren't true, I would have told you. And I think he is true. And I think he is faithful. He's the faithful and true one. And he said, if there's no heaven, I would have told you. And I think Jesus would have. I think he would have. If it were a fairy story to make you feel better about going into the dark, Jesus would have told us. So he said, you believe in God? Believe in me. There is a heaven. There's a mansion. It's for you. I don't care about the house. The thing that I care about is that Jesus has prepared a place for me. I love to come home. Heather has made our home wonderful. She's always like, oh, it's messy. It's not messy. It's comfortable. I'd rather live somewhere that's comfortable than in a museum. 
I just would. And I don't know if she believes me, but I love our house. Heather's made it that way. She's made it for us. My snacks are in the cupboard. <laughs> the, the, the stuff that I use to make special drinks for Hugo's in the fridge. The toys and the things that help Evangeline feel better and feel comfortable are there. The blanket is hung in her room the way that it has to be hung or she cannot fall asleep. Heather's done such a wonderful job of making our home. Without Heather, it would just be a house. And she's made it a home. And I love it. And she, it's only taken her a couple years to do that. Jesus said, I'm making a place for you. Your snacks in the fridge. The stuff, the pieces there that you need to feel at home. Jesus said, if it weren't true, I'd tell you. All my hopes are on this. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He said, I'm not going to make you a house and then forget you. I'm not going to get it all ready for you and then be like, what's missing? Oh, yeah. The person I made it for. He's going to come and get you. Christian, he hasn't forgotten you. He remembers you. Your name is graven on his hands. He died for you. He's not forgotten. And he's coming to get you. That where he is, Jesus said that where I am, there ye may be also. Closing the message this morning, some of you may be here saying, okay, but how do I know? How do I get up? part of this. Jesus said, whither I go, you know, in the way you know. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? They, have, they won't invent rockets for another couple thousand years, Jesus. And even if we had one, how do we get there? Pro tip, it's not in a rocket. That's right. How can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the way. All right, if every head is bowed and I had close, and uh, Sister Pat, if you're able to come and just sort of play quietly on the piano, I want to invite you here at the close of the service to take a moment to do a little bit of business with God before we're done. What did God want to say to you personally today? Every one of you has been living through something. And I believe that God would like to speak to you directly in whatever that situation is that you're in. Whatever is going on in your life, this is a moment for you to talk to God. I'm not against altar calls. I, I like those from time to time. But today I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to come forward. But I would like to ask you, if you would, please, to take a moment of quietness with you and the Lord. Listen, if you're here today or you're watching the live stream, could I ask you if God is speaking to you about your need for Jesus Christ? If you are trying to get to heaven through your good works, you cannot succeed. It will not work. You cannot earn your way to heaven. And Jesus is coming back. And so whether that day is glorious or terrifying, it depends on which side of Jesus you are. I can't wait to see him because I know him and he knows me. He died to save me. He adopted me into his family and he calls me beloved. He's my savior and my God and my king. And I cannot wait to see him and have him set the world right. Please don't make Jesus your enemy. Don't be one of those that puts your hope in the power of the world. 
Don't be a member of the vast army that opposes God. It's foolish of those soldiers at Armageddon to point their guns at God. But it's just as foolish to oppose God with your life. Do you know for sure that you're right with God? Do you know for sure that you're saved? That your sins have all been forgiven? If you're not 100% sure, you can be. Would you let us take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure? Please don't delay. I really think it's coming. I think it's close. Please don't wait. If you're here this morning, you are saved. I believe most of you are. Are you living ready for Christ's return? Now, the glorious second coming is still a ways off. Some stuff's got to happen before the white horse and the armies in Armageddon. But the rapture, the rescue of the church, that could come at any moment. There's nothing hindering that from being tomorrow or from being today. Are you ready for Christ's return? Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back.